Okay. Hi, everybody. It's Melissa from Wee Tong Lin. Um, I'm so happy to have Kristen Snowden here again. Um, I wish she would just do a monthly webinar for us. Um, today, she's going to talk about betrayal blindness. And I'm going to pass it over to her and she can give you all her background and everything. And if you haven't had a chance, there are other webinars that she's done and everything is in the We Tong Lin Presents section. So go for it, Kristen. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Kristen Snowden. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in California. And um, I appreciate you joining me today. We are um, going to talk about what tends to be a relatively controversial topic. You know, I kind of talk about this subject with a little bit of trepidation because I think it's going to be heard in different ways, but let's go for it. We're going to talk about what we call betrayal blindness. And I'm also going to be talking about how that's kind of sometimes connected to the fawning or pleasing and appeasing trauma response, like the nervous system wiring that we have in us when we respond um, in our intimate relationships. So for those of you who have been going through this deep level of betrayal, and, and there's no doubt that it is extremely traumatizing. This is just throwing your entire life upside down. There are so many things that we have to work through. Um, we have to face just the devastation of the betrayal, uh, like the fact that there's been a loss of your partnership or what you thought your partnership was, the loss of what your family, what you thought your family was, memories, traditions, your reality gets totally turned upside down. You thought you knew this person, you thought they were working as a teammate to you, and then you just find out they have this whole other life um, going on. This is the type of betrayal that is experienced and the trauma that's experienced when you uncover that your partner has an unknown sex addiction, problematic porn use, substance abuse, or any kind of behavior where there is a regular double life being lived by your partner, people you don't know about, affairs you don't know about, entire behaviors and money being spent that you're aware of, weren't aware of, but also usually it comes with a heavy dose of lying, sneaking around, emotional abuse, gaslighting. And again, I talk about all these different topics in a lot more detail on my YouTube channel, um, Kristen Snowden, and on my webinars through sexandrelationshiphealing.com. Um, so aside from all those devastating pieces of kind of dealing with the uncovering of betrayal, there's common questions that show up when clients come into my office and it's, how did I not see that this was happening? How did I not know? Um, and most importantly, another follow-up question is, how do I keep myself safe in the future? How can I notice when things aren't making sense, when my partner is not in recovery or not living in a congruent, safe way? How can I keep myself safe? So the framework that I feel like is best used to explore those really important questions is the framework of understanding a concept called betrayal blindness, coined by um, a psychologist, Dr. Jennifer Freyd. Um, the way that she defines betrayal blindness is an unawareness, a not knowing, or even a forgetting exhibited by people towards someone who is betraying them. Um, it was introduced, the term betrayal blindness, in 1996 by Dr. Freyd, um, and she's written several books on the concept of betrayal trauma, um, betrayal blindness, et cetera. Um, and obviously, this concept of betrayal blindness can be used to explain a lot of close, intimate, relational betrayals from um, familial sexual abuse, domestic violence, to also uncovering a familiar or an unknown addiction in your family, in your family system. Now, 
again, I introduced this concept of um, betrayal blindness with trepidation because I always get worried that people are going to hear this information as there was something wrong with you that you didn't know. Um, please do not ever hear it that way. There, You have far more information in this moment, hopefully, than you did before you uncovered anything. And know that your betraying partner was highly, highly invested in keeping you in the dark, making sure you did not, you were not given all the information you needed to make healthy decisions for yourself. Um, there was a lot of kind of distraction, like pay attention to this over here and not what's happening here through lots of emotional manipulation. So never hear this idea that betrayal blindness is, is a way of saying that this was your fault, that this was presentable. So nothing you did, not your background, not any kind of trauma history, if you even had any, because many of you had healthy, safe, secure childhoods. And that is why you, you gave your partner the benefit of the doubt. Um, so none of your choices, your behaviors, or even lack of choices or behaviors, like you didn't do this or you didn't do that, none of those had anything to do with your partner's decision to live a double life, to hide it and continue it with um, months, years, decades of lying and manipulation. And also, never hear with betrayal, blindness, or even this fawning, please or please, um, trauma response, that there is anything wrong with the fact that you've decided, for those of you who have decided to stay in a relationship, there's nothing wrong with the fact that you've decided to do that. You know, staying in there, hanging in there to see if your partner can get recovery, if you guys can rebuild trust and continue on in your relationship. Um, so, but with that said, I just want to make sure that when crisis hits, right, when we found out that this huge thing happened underneath us, right, um, Omar Minwala Walla talks about this secret sexual basement or the secret life that they have going on underneath the house, our family house, that once that happens, you really want to take a step back and explore any kind of patterns that your partner might have shown, um, ways that you kind of maybe sensed something was off or something was wrong or something didn't make sense, um, and how you responded in those moments. Because, I mean, the worst case scenario is if you believed there's absolutely nothing that you could do in the present day moment, you know, in, improving your instincts and intuition, responding differently, holding boundaries, it would be pretty scary if they, you felt like in this here and now with this new um, set of information that you're working from, that you couldn't set up um, new reactions, new behaviors to keep yourself safe. That's kind of at this point, that's all you have to kind of lean into until your partner works a really strong recovery program and just becomes um, better at helping you feel safe and reconnected and comfortable with being vulnerable with them. So without further ado, let's talk a little bit about um, betrayal blindness. So as I said, it's betrayal blindness is an unawareness, not knowing and forgetting exhibiting by people towards betrayal. Um, there's a really interesting book called The Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker. And he talks about how um, he's someone who does a lot of risk management. Um, I think he was even the security detail to um, Bezos, the Amazon um, owner. So he does a lot of research and studying about how people stay safe and how people can use their own instincts and intuition, the gift of fear, hence that title, to notice when someone is untrustworthy, to notice when something isn't safe. That, that kind of has that, that the hair raise up on their arms and their instincts of just someone saying, I don't like that person. There's just something off about them. So we are given a lot of instincts and intuition to try to detect potential betrayers in our life. Um, however, Jennifer Freyd um, comes in and kind of 
invites us to explore the idea that the problem with those instincts and intuition that are meant to help us know when we're being betrayed, lied to, when something just isn't right, um, is that when we are in an intimate connection with another person, when we have a bond with someone where we've exchanged vows, we've had children and lives together, we are operating from this belief system that we are secure, that that we can trust this person, that they're giving us the benefit of the doubt. Uh, like we don't expect them to have all these lies going on underneath. Um, so there's times, and it's not only that, but when we're building a life with them where there's a, a healthy level of dependency, because as you know, every secure relationship, there's a healthy level of need being shared. You know, I'll take on this, you take on that. Uh, maybe you make a little bit more money than I do, so I'll pay for this. You maybe help out with um, maintaining the home or um, taking care of the children. And there's healthy levels of dependency where you need to have that person in your life. And let's also not forget, there's also love. There's history. There's connection. And, and she invites us to explore how having all those things present in our life, while they're wonderful, while there's nothing wrong with having a secure attachment where you're giving your partner the benefit of the doubt, that sometimes, and usually only retrospectively, do we realize that we probably gave them too much of the benefit of the doubt, or we certainly would be benefiting now, knowing more information now to kind of reassess that and say, wow, were there ever times that I really was uncomfortable with something, the way that they were behaving, the the phone calls that were coming in, the hours they were working, and I wanted to say something. I was not comfortable with it. I didn't feel like my needs were being met. I was angry. But then because I was operating from secure attachment, from I was operating from a place of, well, you know, this is just how it works and I'm going to try to do this and I'm going to try to do that to try to help out the situation. And you kind of sweep it under the rug. Um, so there's an idea that when there's a strong, intimate bond in a relationship that can sometimes leave us prone to being blind to betrayal or letting things go that you normally wouldn't let go if it just someone did that to you off the street. Um, it's important to add, by the way, that I think this is really interesting that Jennifer Frey, Dr. Frey's background is she was an expert testifier for um, all those Catholic priests that had abused uh, the young children in their congregation or whatever you call it. Um, because there was the huge defense was saying, well, why didn't they speak up till now? You know, they, maybe they lied about it. Maybe they made up this story in their head. And all of a sudden 30 years later, they're telling us a lie about the priests abusing them. Cause why, why wouldn't they just you know, say, oh, this is terrible. No one should be doing this to me. And it's really interesting parallel to think about that in your marriage. You know, when someone, the parallel will be, oh, well, my husband just kept coming home late from work or he would come home or my, you know, wife or husband would come home and just start raging at me. And I really wouldn't know why, or he or she would come home and just start, um, would just be emotionally cut off and would be so cold to me. And you would kind of just say, that doesn't feel right. I don't like it. I'm not getting my needs met. But then another day just goes by and another day goes by. So as an expert witness that was supporting those who was who were coming out 30 years later, she was really just pointing out the psychology of when you have intimate connections, you know, when you are groomed by a priest, when you are made to feel special. You were made to think that um, this was someone you could trust and that they had your best interest in mind, that you're, you face this extreme, extreme cognitive dissonance where it doesn't make sense. Is this person 
loving me and showing me how special I am to them or are they abusing me? Um, and so it's really interesting to kind of know her background. And um, if you're fascinated by what I'm talking about, like I said, she has a couple different books on this topic. Um, but it, I think of when I read her material about how, um, you know, I have some clients that are with uh, sex addicts who are not in recovery. And for a lot of people, they hear the story of, you know, well, you said if he kept relapsing, if he kept cheating on you, you'd be out. What's going on? And th it's really important to just kind of continue to explore. And I'm going to be asking some questions at the end of this lecture to help you explore that topic about what's going on. And again, there's no blame and shame of you deciding to stay. This is your life. You get to do what you want. But I certainly would invite you to kind of sit with some of these questions that we're going to be talking about. So let's talk about some of the reasons why someone might be experiencing betrayal blindness. Um, and of course, this obviously can depend, um, vary just depending on the individual, what was going on with them and the circumstances around the betrayal. Um, but here are some reasons. So there's sometimes an underlying fear of losing the relationship or a very obvious fear of losing the relationship that they will kind of put aside what they're seeing, what they're experiencing, the betrayal, the lying. They know it's not okay. They know it's not the way that they want to live life, but they are just not ready to wrap their brain around the idea of being out of the relationship. That the fear that they're experiencing, thinking about leaving the relationship is more overwhelming than what is happening in the relationship right then, right there. Um, another reason is that they are stuck in that cognitive dissonance that I just talked about. You know, they're somewhat this person that it's like, this is my person. This is my partner, meaning my sex addict or um, the addict where you just uncovered the betrayal or they continue to relapse. You know, I don't believe in, in divorce. I believe in sticking it out. If I was sick and I was struggling, they would stick it out for, with me. Um, and they have two conflicting beliefs. You know, this person is capable of being loving um, if they would just kind of clean up their act. And, and one minute, maybe they're saying loving things to me that they are going to fix themselves and, and they value me. But then all of a sudden they, you find out they're not real, they're not in recovery. There's been some more lies, et cetera. So there's this constant pull in both directions where you know, they should be acting this way, right? They should be changing, um, building up empathy and compassion, going to meetings, um, being honest, trying to help you feel safe again. They should be doing those things after you've uncovered the betrayal. But the reality is, is that they might still be blame shifting. They might be telling you to kind of get over it. When are you going to get over it? There might be some more gaslighting, manipulation. Maybe they're not acting out in the same way, but they're kind of like the dry drunks where they still have those unhealthy, abusive type degrading um, personalities with you. Another reason is that there's attachment to the betrayer. So like I said, you usually have a secure attachment with your partner. You usually feel like they're your person. Um, and so sometimes, you know, even we, we do the same thing with our kids where you, you know your kid inside and out. So even when they're having a hard day at school or even when they're making bad choices, sometimes we can kind of spend more time empathizing with them, being compassionate and, and just kind of like, oh, I know my kid or I know my partner. I know he means best. I know he's been through a lot of trauma. So I'm going to give him a pass. But we need to be really careful about how many passes we give them. Um, and also, I said this, um, I'm going to say more about this in a minute, but don't ever, you can still be empathetic, but have very clear boundaries and consequences, right? I can still see someone, know they're hurting, knowing they're in a tough spot, but saying, but I also know when you're hurting in a tough spot, 
I can come so, sometimes be the target of your abuse. So I'm going to have to create some boundaries so I can keep myself safe and keep myself in a stable place. Another reason why um, they might have betrayal blindness issues is, is there's shame and embarrassment, or even sometimes they might blame themselves. They can be embarrassed about the betrayal, shameful of it. And so maybe they might minimize it or, um, you know, just really hope that it gets better and cleans up or even just socially, again, not ready to break up, to live separately um, because of the shame and embarrassment of what's happened. And it is, it's very, can feel very humiliating, very embarrassing, um, which is of course why we need to find communities like this, the Wee Tonglin. Um, to be around other people who can kind of understand and um, hopefully you can work on shame resiliency around that topic. Another reason why you might be um, struggling with betrayal blindness is because of trauma. If you've watched any of my trauma videos, you would know that the trauma we experience growing up will wire our nervous system. So sometimes, you know, Pat Carnes talks about this in his book, um, Betrayal Bonds, but when we continue to be in this very confusing state where I'm getting gaslighted or one minute my partner's present and okay, and then the next minute they're lashing out and yelling at the kids or just really emotionally dysregulated, if that becomes a common pattern, our nervous system just starts kind of setting it to that's normal for us. And, and we kind of just turn the other cheek and just go, okay, I'm just going to go focus on other things. I'm going to kind of distract myself. Okay, well, I'll just kind of make plans with other people. I'll spend my time and energy um, pretty in the house or doing things I have control of, like performing at work, taking care of the kids, because this is just this issue with my spouse is just not, I don't know what's going on and I don't know how to fix it, right? Um so paying attention to the way our nervous system can cause ourselves to kind of disassociate from the chaos and what we should be experiencing, you know, should is alarm, concern, sometimes fear, um, the desire to protect ourselves, to protect others. But instead, we kind of just disconnect and go, oh, OK, I'm just going to move over here. Um Another reason why we are exposed to betrayal blindness is something you all know too, too well about this issue, which is that you've just not been given all the information. There's been years and years of gaslighting, manipulation, straight direct line that you just don't quite realize the extent of the betrayal, the extent of your partner's maybe mental health issues, um, problems, et cetera, because you've just been denied everything that you need to know. Um, so a common response or something that kind of might fall under the umbrella of betrayal blindness is the, the trauma response of fawning, pleasing, or peasing. Um, it's important to talk about fawning, pleasing, and peasing because when we're trying to negotiate this really elaborate thing we have called a family system where we have our partner, our addict partner, his or her acting out behaviors, his or her instability, emotional dysregulation, our crisis state where we're just trying to make it through the day, um, try to just keep our kids protected from what's going on just trying to keep my job, keep the bills paid, you know, we're in a high, high level of distress. So it's important for us to kind of be able to put a name or identify a pattern of a stress response, which is called the fawning stress response. It's also called the please and appease stress response. Um, you guys have heard about the other stress responses. I fight, I flee, I freeze. And then the fawning is the fourth thing. Um, and the fawning stress response is a coping mechanism that can occur in relationships where there might be a power imbalance, or you just feel disempowered to ignite any kind of meaningful change, right? I've looked at all the exits. I've tried to ask to go to therapy. I've tried to ask him to go to meetings. I'm trying to see if he, he or she will stabilize so we can get our home to be less chaotic or for me to get some of my needs met. But the answer is always no. So I've 
tried to exert power in this relationship and the answer is always no, it's not going to happen. So as a consequence, I've altered my crisis response to more of just a pleasing and peasing, let's just calm it down, let's de-escalate it in any way possible because I'm just going for um, like safety or stability rather than getting my needs met. So it's a strong desire to please and to please that other person in another in a way to avoid harm, dysregulation, punishment, et cetera. Obviously, there's more extreme versions of that if there's like domestic violence or abuse, right? It's it's the person trying to jump in um, when the person's drunk and getting ready to punch someone. And it's like, okay, just uh, let's talk about something else. Let's turn on the TV. Let's, um, hey kids, let's go for a walk or let's go out for ice cream, right? You're just trying to do anything you can to downregulate that situation, to get back to a place where people aren't going to be harmed or emotionally harmed or attacked, again, emotionally or physically. So the fawning and stress response looks like people pleasing, avoiding confrontation, ignoring red flags, so mi minimizing problematic behaviors in their partner. Again, that's like the betrayal blindness. Um, and isolating themselves from others or from a support system that might anger the um, the acting out partner. Um, kind of taking on criticism. So, you know, they come out and they kind of lash at you emotionally and you just kind of take it. So kind of building a higher level of tolerance or uh, and then also ignoring cues of like, I'm really uncomfortable. This is really hurtful. I'm scared right now to just kind of downregulate calm the um the perpetrator the person acting out and see if you can stabilize it that way um so i'm going to close with how do we get out of the unhealthy cycles of betrayal blindness and or the fawn please or appease stress response um so i have a couple lists and again um on my gaslighting videos I have a list of a few things that I find are helpful to kind of stop that unhealthy cycle. But first and foremost, I encourage everyone to sit down and kind of create a list of values. Who, what do you want to represent? What's important to you? How do you want to be remembered? How do you want people to describe you? What are things in life that are most important things you can't live without? Um, for instance, it could be being kind to others, respect, my my family, uh, a religious or spiritual practice, uh, travel, being the best person I can be, uh, loving, I don't know. But it's it's really important. You know, what is that saying? If you if you don't stand for anything, you can you fall for everything. And so it's idea that you really need to understand, OK, who who do I want to be? Betrayal is turns your whole life and your identity upside down. And so I'd encourage you to try to do some of that work. Um, create a list of non-negotiables. This is the beginning to you standing up and having boundaries. So um, on my website, Kristen Snowden, I have a really great free um, boundaries chart that I joke that when I was going through my relationship crisis and figuring out who I am and how I want to reevaluate myself and go through a personality dialysis and change everything about me and stop unhealthy patterns. I had a boundaries list like this and I used it and I checked on it every day because I want to be on the healthy side. I want to kind of force myself and keep myself accountable to stay on the healthy side of boundaries and how to conduct myself with other people versus the unhealthy side. Um, so, and also that includes creating lists of non-negotiables. This is just things that are absolutely not okay. No name calling, no emotional or physical abuse, no more cheating, um, no criticizing, no drug or alcohol use, no stealing, mocking, mocking self, et cetera. Or getting, accepting mockery from another person. Keeping a journal. Um, what you try to do when you're trying to keep a journal or the other thing is practicing mind body connection um, type of exercises or incorporating those every day. The idea is that betrayal throws off all trauma, throws off your mind body connection. You don't even know what you're feeling, what you're thinking. You know, I have a client again, the partner keeps relapsing. 
he's behaving in really concerning ways, um, very erratic. And she's kind of like, yeah, I should be scared. Like I should want to pack my bag up and run because this is very strange behavior, very erratic, very inconsistent. But it's often, it's from the trauma. And again, that nervous system rewiring around that trauma that you can't even truly plug in to those instincts and intuition that are saying this is unsafe. You know, you need to, to change your behavior, set up some um, consequence structure and boundaries to, to create safety and stability again for yourself um, or your family. So I encourage keeping a journal to really start writing out your daily thoughts and feelings. Don't censor yourself. Um, notice the themes, feelings, observations, experiences that you're having that day. And then create like a mindfulness practice. Don't push back on feelings. Don't judge them. Just kind of explore them. I encourage you to kind of spend some enjoyable time alone or even just with people outside your, your family system. So with healthy friends or family doing things for yourself, you know, not people that tell you what you should or would do, or why don't you just get rid of the guy, but spending, building up a tolerance for being alone, um, finding out how it feels, do insecurities come up for you? Do fears come up for you? Does confusion come up for you? Um, or even is what does it feel like to have other people be more stable, more compassionate, be able to listen to you, validate you, not gaslight you? That can only be done when you go out and explore other relationships. I'm always a fan. Next step is to work some kind of 12-step program. For those non-addicts, um, Scott Brasser from sexandrelationshiphealing.com and I wrote a book called Life Anonymous, where it's kind of uh, a book on how those who are identified as addicts work the steps and those who don't identify as addicts can work the steps. There's also Al-Anon, there's pro-dependence. Um, those are all ways that you can work the steps because why it helps you um, like notice your traumas that, you know, your childhood wounds, your current strengths and weaknesses, shame resiliency. I have a million videos on that and how shame shows up creating that fellowship for you you know, that spending time with other people who can validate you. Um, last couple things are this. I'd encourage you to never defend or debate what you know be, to be the truth. I say this with the gaslighting videos. The facts are the facts. Hopefully now you're living in um, the truth. You've been denied the truth about your partner's struggles for years now, maybe. And now you know that he or she has a problem. He, he or she's had this secret basement. There's been lying and gaslighting and manipulation around it. So do not sit there with your addict, especially the one that's not in recovery, and try to debate and defend what you know to be true. It's just, uh, you know, an exercise of futility. Um, you, a lot of the times I just encourage clients to just say, we're going to have to agree to disagree. You know, you think you're in recovery because you go to six meetings a week. I see lots of uh, concerning behaviors, lots of lying or lying by omission um, and, and emotional erratic behavior that makes me feel unsafe. So you might think you're in recovery when you do those things. We're going to have to agree to disagree because. I'm not feeling like you're in recovery. Um, I mentioned this before, but also remember you can have empathy and compassion for your partner's struggles, but still have boundaries. I work with a lot of active addicts, especially when I was in my treatment centers. I can have a lot of empathy for the pain and trauma and struggles they've had to face. It doesn't mean that I um, am okay with them being abusive or lying or um, saying that they're going to show up, but then they don't show up like those. I can still have boundaries and um, be empathetic for their situation and never, ever invalidate your own experience or feelings, your feelings, your experiences, your fear, your instability, your desire to have your needs met and feel safe and have a partner that's in recovery None of those are invalid, nor should anyone ever make you feel like those are invalid. So I'm going to close with this. 
I want you to take some time to explore your cognitive dissonance that often comes up because of betrayal. It's deeply confusing. It throws your life and your framework and what you thought to be true and real, it just throws it upside down. So I want you to just kind of ask yourself in the current relationship that you are in, and whether you've left the relationship or you're still with your partner who betrayed you, I want you to ask yourself, do you feel safe? Does is this person feel safe to you? His or her behaviors, choices, his recovery, his or her recovery plan, do those all feel safe to you? Do you like your partner? Or are there at least glimmers or moments where you feel like you like your partner? Do you want to be in this relationship? Is it something that you desire? Do you feel like your betraying partner is trying his or her best to seek recovery, change, and also thereby make you feel safe to stay in the relationship? And if your answers are no to any of those questions, You need to take a deep dive. I usually encourage you to do it with a therapist or maybe a 12-step fellowship, which is if those answers are no, then why are you still in the relationship? And again, it's okay if there's reasons. I have medical needs. um, We just financially doesn't work. We have kids that are still in the house and I'm just not ready to do that to them. Those answers are all okay. There's no judgment, but I just want you to say it out loud and kind of own that, that maybe I don't feel safe. I don't really want to be in this relationship. I don't think that they're in recovery or doing everything that they need to be doing, but this is the deal. You know, this is what I know to be true. These are the kind of the facts. um, And it is what it is. And with that, I'm just going to finish by saying, um, I just added two more workshops to my website, kristensnowden.com. They both start mid April. But I wanted to give the the viewers that we tongle in an opportunity to sign up early um, to ensure that there's space. Um, but those so those are under kristensnowden.com and live workshops. Um, and there's two options of Betrayal Trauma 101 group and the Brene Brown Daring Greatly, um, where we kind of talk about value building, uh, vulnerability, trust building, shame, resiliency, et cetera. Okay. Next is, um, I spoke up every time I was uncomfortable when he worked late and I got gaslighted. Yeah, lied to, manipulated. Even when I had pretty much figured out my husband was cheating on me, I calmly confronted him and I was told I was crazy for thinking that. I And you are not alone. And it's it's really important to start exploring. Um, Again, you're, first of all, just validate the fact that you were doing your best. No one handed you a book when you were falling in love with this person and getting married to them to say, oh, what about if the man of your dreams just starts lying to you and making you feel like you're crazy? Then do the following three um, steps. It, it, it's un, You can't even wrap your brain around what's happening at first. Like, I don't even understand. I don't get it. I know that you're cheating. Why is your first reaction not to try to make me feel safe? Why are you not trying to, you know, I've had so many clients say, I uncovered this cheating. He or she should be coming to me saying, I'm so sorry. I'll never do this again. What do I need to do to repair this relationship? I'm embarrassed. I, you know, I'm so sorry that I hurt you. And Obviously, a lot of the ones that are showing up in my office, the problem is that it's not that kind of reaction. But I'm still going to invite you that every day you you get a little bit more time to sit with that. And and the most important part about trauma, once you've had it validated that this is, is indeed trauma, what happened to you is not okay, his reaction is not okay, is that you have to write a story of empowerment around it. And so you know the facts, you know what has happened, you know the way that you were lied to, manipulated, gaslighted, and continue to be so. But if you're going to get through this trauma, you have to find a way to dig up a story of empowerment around it. You can't control him, but what can you control? 
what kind of things do you think you might need to do here and now to keep yourself safe, to keep your family safe, to keep your sanity? So those are all important questions. This says, I can't help but feel shame because I found out about my husband's acting out a year into our marriage and I stayed with no boundaries. I probably just had no self-worth. I don't feel like I have the blindness because I know all along what he was up to. Now, 13 years in, I'm still in the marriage, even though he is not in recovery, but he is sober for five months um, and we're living apart because he's not following my boundaries. Um, well, first of all, I think it's incredible what you've done recently. Um, for, for clients that know that their partner has an alcohol abuse issue or um, a raging problem, and they come in, you know, week after week or month after month and say, you know, I'm unhappy in my relationship. I'm unhappy with my partner. I always kind of say, when enough is enough, you will do something. You know, I don't have to give you any kind of speech. I might guide you and help you with um, boundaries, consequences, help you explore actually your own feelings. You know, is enough enough? Do you get to have needs? How, what has it felt like? Um, do Are you uncertain or scared about the future? How do you view leaving this relationship versus staying in it? You know, exploring those kind of things. but. I always accept that the process or the decision to leave a partnership is huge. I mean, it's probably one of the most significant decisions you make in your life, maybe next to, oh, you have cancer and you can treat it this way or you can treat it that way. We're not sure which way is going to make you live or die. I mean, it is really like it feels like a life or death decision. And you'll sit there and you'll consider the options until you feel comfortable with the decision and feel comfortable is not the right word because I think we move in either direction, whether we stay in the relationship or leave a direct uh, relationship, we do it with a level of fear and uncertainty because we only have so much control and we definitely have no control of that person. So I just kind of want to validate that sometimes it takes a long time to feel like this isn't working anymore. Um, I'd encourage you to do some work on your shame because that might really, really help you transcend this extreme betrayal. Um, and yeah, I just, I wish you the best on your journey. It's it's not hard, but you're not alone with that, the describing the what you described. If you know you have betrayal blindness or at least so in love with, or, or are at least so in love with and sure of the potential in your partner that your attachment bond won't let you give up on them. Is that unhealthy? Can you have, do you have to recognize your blindness and attachment and then change or leave the relationship? Or is it okay to give them a chance? This is your life and you get to do whatever it is you feel comfortable with. Um, and just like your partner, I mean, he or she could choose to never stop um, the acting out behaviors and that's his or her life and it'll work for them until it doesn't work anymore. So yeah, there's no unhealthy or healthy. I will always ask, how is it working for you? You know, have you had a lot of physical consequences to li living in that unstable state? Do you feel like you minimize the betrayal are you do you feel safe in the relationship do you feel like you're getting your needs met do you feel like um your partner is trying his or her best um and then ask you know is it just that you feel so much potential in your partner or are there other things that kind of keep you in the relationship so I just kind of feel like just do a full state of the union. You know, that's why I encourage the daily journaling. Why are you here? What's okay? What's not okay? How are you feeling today? Is there hope? There's no right or wrong answer. Um, and, and no one has the manual to tell you, you know, the how to's and the formula for happiness. Close with reminding you to check out, I have those two new webinars on kristensnowden.com. Um, and I also have my YouTube channel where I talk about all these things in a lot more detail, Kristen Snowden. 
And if you have any further questions or concerns, my email is Kristen Snowden, MFT, as in marriage and family therapist, at gmail.com. And I appreciate everyone joining us. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, you everyone. Bye-bye. Bye.